Well, a good evening to everyone, and we want to welcome you this evening to our Kansas Farm Bureau Interactive Town Hall. Uh, first of all, I want to say that if you have questions, uh, if you will go ahead and submit those in the Q&A or the chat box, we'll get to those here in a little bit. But our guest for this evening is our first district congressman, Tracy Mann. I'm going to take just a moment and introduce Tracy with a few remarks. And Tracy, I know many of us know him, but others, uh, just for background, Tracy grew up in a farm family in Western Kansas. He's been exposed to a lot of things, a lot of hard work early in life, uh, had a great education at attending Kansas State University. After his college days, he spent some time working in commercial real estate and also has been involved in some banking operations. He did have the opportunity to serve as the 50th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Kansas to really get his teeth wet on serving in the government at the state level. But in November of 2020, he was elected as the U.S. Congressman from the big first district. And serving in that capacity, he's been able to do and fulfill what he said when he did run his campaign. He serves on the House Ag Committee and also the Committee of Veteran Affairs. But with that, Tracy, give you the opportunity to tell a little bit about what's going on in D.C., a, a little bit about the issues that are of concern to you and some of the priorities that you see coming about. Yeah, great. Well, Rich, thank you. Um, and thanks for the Kansas Farm Bureau for having this. Thanks, everybody, for caring about agriculture, ag policy, the country, uh, for, for tuning in. Uh, you, you know, as everybody on this call um, likely knows, Kansas Farm Bureau has been at this for over 100 years. Uh, the respect, it, it's hard for me to overemphasize the respect that Rich and, and Terry and Ryan and the rest of the team have in Kansas uh, and around the country. I'll tell you a small example of that. We've had four Ag Committee hearings so far. Zippy Duvall, who's the American Farm Bureau president, um, was on two of those. And the majority of the questions are directed to him because the Ag Committee cares a lot what Zippy thinks because they know that he represents you all, uh, the, the farmers of the country. So testament to the organization. I thought I would give a quick, um, really quick overview, introduction, <clears throat> a few things, talk about overall legislation briefly, and then really spend the bulk of our time, of course, talking about agriculture. <clears throat> as we get started here, you know, this, this map is helpful. So this is the big first district. You know, this is Kansas. Of course, I get to represent the, the best district in the country, and that's the green on that map. Um, this is a map, a map that I think about every day. I know that most people don't. Our lines are, look different than the Farm Bureau district lines. It's important to know that the big first district of Kansas, uh, we are the number three ag producing district in the country. It's also not lost to me. I, I view it as my job, along with um, Carson Essis and LaTurner, uh, you know, to advocate for um, all of the state, you know, not just our district. And as we know, agriculture is agriculture, no matter where it is in Kansas. Um, but the big first of Kansas is the number three ag producing district in the country. Uh, we are number one in the country for beef production. We are number one in the country for sorghum production. We're number one for wheat. We're number seven for corn. Uh, I think we're number 11 for dairy. So big ag district, uh, people care a lot of what, about you know, what Kansas thinks as everyone knows that we are a, a very significant ag state. Um, you know, year to date, Gus, one in on January the 3rd, our, our team is in place and I purposely built our legislative team to be ag-centric, ag-heavy to reflect my priorities and the priorities of the district. I'm Brandon Harder, our chief of staff, grew up on a farm south of Hutch in Haven. Um, our legislative director is um, Riley Padgett. He came over from the USDA. Uh, Catherine Thomas, uh, she worked for um, Senator Roberts um, doing ag issues for him and the rest of our, we have some other um, exciting announcements maybe coming up here, but really excited for the depth of expertise and knowledge and the ag-centric team that we've been able to build. Uh, we have offices open in Manhattan and one in Dodge City. Um, of course, our Washington DC office. And so anyone here is welcome to stop by any of our offices at any time. Um, we are here to serve you. On the committee front, I got on the Ag Committee, um, which, which uh, President Fels just mentioned and the Veterans Affairs Committee as well. A quick legislative update um, for context. So, you know, last fall, everyone knows what's happened with the presidential election. I think most people know that um, the Senate right now is 50-50 Republicans, Democrats. So it is, you know, jammed up really tight. 
what people don't really know as much about or focus as much on is the House of Representatives. So going into November, everyone thought Republicans would lose um, 10 seats. We actually, Republicans gained 15 seats, which means that the um, Republican to Democrat ratio today is five. So um, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House by five votes which means the Senate is 50-50, but the House is razor thin margins as well, which has led to hyper-partisanship. So, and you all know this because uh, you follow, those of you that follow it on the news, but you know, the um, level of partisanship is at an all time high. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people um, on both sides on the extremes, you know, well, political grandstand, but that that's where we are as a country right now. And we have seen so far some very significant policies pass the House, laws pass the House, but have not passed the Senate yet. Um, things like HR1, which would federalize our elections, um, things like some efforts to make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. Um, we will see efforts likely to um, change the makeup of the Supreme Court, uh, implement aspects of the Green New Deal, uh, a lot of things that, that would be bad for agriculture, uh, if, if those policies go into effect and, and bad for Kansas and the Kansans by and large uh, in the big first and throughout the state do not want to see happen. So uh, th th that's kind of what we're seeing right now. The Ag Committee uh, is really important right now. So there were 20 freshmen that applied to get on six spots. So we had six openings, uh, 20 of us freshmen wanted to get on the Ag Committee. We were very pleased. It was a competition. Uh, very pleased that we got a spot on the committee, which was my highest priority by far. Uh, the committee so far, so the makeup of the committee, I think is important for everybody to understand uh, the lay of the land. So today on the House Ag Committee, we have Chairman Scott. He is just became the new chairman of the House Ag Committee. Uh, he represents his district in Georgia. He is um, Atlanta and then south and west of Atlanta a little bit. And when I meet with a member, I always try to figure out you know, where they're from, because that's going to be indicative about what their priorities are. And then the top Republican on the House Ag Committee, uh, their term is ranking member. So the ranking member is Glenn or G.T. Thompson. He's from Pennsylvania. So he's new in his role as well. Um, have hit it off with, uh, with Congressman Thompson. He's become a fast friend. You'll be pleased to know, or I was pleased to learn, that in his district, it's central Pennsylvania, a lot of corn. Uh, he cares a lot about crop insurance. He's on the crop insurance caucus. Um, so crop insurance is a priority for him. A lot of dairy uh, in his district. And like I said, we, uh, we have become fast friends. Um, it's also interesting right now when you look at the members of the Ag Committee. So there's about 40 members, uh, you know, 27-ish uh, Democrats, about 50 members, but 27 uh, Democrats, 23 Republicans. Um, of the Republicans, on the Ag Committee, you know, typically we have more from the Midwest than we do right now. Um, today, I'm really the only member uh, from the Midwest other than Dusty Johnson, who's from South Dakota. So, you know, there's no one on the House Ag Committee today from Oklahoma uh, or from West Texas or from Eastern Colorado or from Nebraska, uh, which is important because I view it as my job to very loudly advocate for the type of agriculture that we experience in Kansas, the crops that we grow. And it's not that others in other parts of the country are against that. They just sometimes have different focuses. So that's, I think that's an important aspect for, for everyone to be aware of. Our very first committee hearing, hearing Chairman Scott laid out his priorities for the Ag Committee for the next two years in, in this order. And those priorities were number one, uh, taking care of socially disadvantaged farmers, um, priority number two, uh, making sure he takes care of the HBC, the historical black colleges around the country. Uh, number three, food and nutrition programs. Uh, number four, rural broadband, which I certainly support rural broadband. And I just tell you that so that you know, these are the priorities of, of the chairman. The hearings we have so far reflect those priorities. Those priorities are his priorities. I would say those are different priorities than we have seen historically in the past from the chairman of the House Ag Committee. So we will see how, you know, we will see how that plays out. We um, have had a hearing so far. We've had four hearings. The first one was on climate. 
uh, the second one, uh, well, we've had four uh, on various topics, and I can get into those in greater detail if you would like. My priorities for agriculture, for the Ag Committee, uh, my time in Congress is to advocate for agriculture and our conservative Kansas values. Um, you know, number one issue is trade. And with our current commodity prices, you know, we see the importance of trade. We all know that we have got to continue to robustly develop strong trading partners, good relationships around the world as we acknowledge that that the real value and the majority of, of the mouths that, that are able to consume our ag products um, today don't live in Kansas or even in the country. There's so much opportunity to export our fantastic ag products and add value to them here and, and, and send those around the world. So trade is a huge priority for me. Uh, number two is to crop insurance and other risk management tools. You know, the, the, we all know that in our industry, Mother Nature is our business partner. And, and when that's the case, there are a lot of uncertainty with that. So protecting and strengthening crop insurance and, and other risk management tools is vital, uh, you know, here moving forward. And then thirdly, I think a lot about how do we just prevent and play defense on a lot of bad overreaching regulations from the EPA and others. I'm concerned the waters of the U.S. will raise their head again. You know, I feel like we just finished this marathon of, of it's like a snake. You know, you cut its head off and it wouldn't die, but it finally um, went away. But we fully expect that to be back, as well as a lot of other um, environmental policies that could be damaging for agriculture. Uh, a lot of regulations that, that our producers certainly uh, I don't want to see as well. Uh, there's some other issues I, um, I want to touch on, then we can open up here. I'm very concerned about the most recent, well, overall, the amount of spending that we're seeing in Washington, you know, we are approaching almost $30 trillion in debt. Um, the new administration has proposed now $6 trillion more spending. Um, the question is, how do we pay for it? Uh, what's been proposed so far is uh, increased in income taxes, um, corporate and otherwise. Uh, very concerned, uh, we gotta make sure that we protect stepped up basis uh, would very concerned with capital gains and estate taxes going up, you know, so I signed on to legislation that would repeal the death tax and also that would preserve the stepped up basis. That is, uh, that is, in, I'm stuck in a committee right now. So I think that's something we all need to watch. It's something I'm watching very closely. We want to be vigilant about that. Um, so, so that's important. Our first hearing was on climate and I, you know, the, the talking points from, um, the Republicans on House Ag Committee is, you know, we need to be talking about climate solutions. And it's important to me that we make sure that that as the climate discussion um, moves forward, whether people agree that climate change is happening or not happening, whether it's man-made or not man-made, whether that's reality, it's a political reality. We need to make sure that agriculture is at the table, that we benefit from it, that there's an acknowledgement of what our producers do uh, positively that helps the environment, that helps the climate, that, that reclaims um, carbon. And we want to make sure that, that there's compensation for agriculture uh, in whatever comes forward from that regard. Uh, we had a hearing on rural broadband, something I'm very passionate about. It does seem like there's bipartisan support for broadband, uh, for rural broadband. There's acknowledgement that this is a big issue. The question is going to be how do we pay for it, but, but it is something that certainly there seems to be pretty broad support for. And then the next farm bill, uh, so our current farm bill expires in 2023, and I anticipate towards the end of this session, so maybe later this year, certainly next year, we'll start to lay some of the groundwork uh, for the next farm bill, and we'll see what the uh, state of agriculture is at that point. So I, I believe now more than ever, it's incredibly important that we tell the story of agriculture as the distance from farm to fork has never been wider, as the country and thus the Congress is more and more urbanized and people are farther and farther removed from where their food comes from. We've got to loudly um, and, and clearly communicate the needs of agriculture, where the country's food comes from to all of our benefit. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, uh, Ryan. And, and again, thanks for having me, uh, Kansas Farm Bureau. Great, thank you, Congressman. That uh, that was a, a great summary of what your first three months, uh, four months, I guess, uh, back in Washington D.C. And I think that's really important for the listeners today. Walk us through uh, January third and then early January. But you know, certainly with COVID, it's not like it would have been in the 116th or a previous Congress. So you know, I've had the privilege of uh, being on some Zooms with you and obviously listening into the House Ag Committee. 
hearings, but are you showing up in person? Are your colleagues sitting across the, the dais there or are things still more of a virtual world even on the, the committee hearing aspect in DC currently? Uh, great question, Ryan. Unfortunately, they're still virtual. Um, the Washington DC is much more closed up still uh, than Kansas is. And, you know, so whenever we're going to vote, we're wearing a mask, our committee hearings, everyone's masked up. Uh, the, the committee hearings, um, Veterans Affairs Committee is all virtual. We've not had a single hearing in person yet. Agriculture um, is hybrid. I always go to the House Ag Committee meetings. I want to be there in person. I want to shake the few people that's there's hand. Oftentimes, frankly, it's me and, and two to five other people that are there, but I think it's important to be in the room, uh, you know, to be where Pat Roberts banged the gavel down when Freedom to Farm occurred. I think that's incredibly important. Um, but to your point, Ryan, the fact that nothing is happening in person, everyone's masked up, makes it very hard to build relationships, to really talk about issues face to face and, and come to some agreement and consensus. So that's an, another layer to why things are so partisan right now is just the lack of communication and dialogue that, that's occurring today in Washington, D.C. I think it's way past time to get things opened up. Uh, members of Congress, everyone that wants to be vaccinated has been the overwhelming majority of people. I'm going to say everybody, but the overwhelming majority has been vaccinated. It's time to return to normal order. It's time to go back, take the mask off. It's time to sit in our committee, committee hearing rooms together and move the country forward. Great. You know, Congressman, I think uh, one question, because you, you kind of went there, and I know it's timely, it's current, all things carbon, all things climate, sustainable, sustainability, regenerative, whatever term of the day we want to use, but that was one of the uh, the hearings that the House Ag Committee has already had, and AFBF President Zippy Duval, I think you mentioned, he did testify there. Uh, FACA, which is, you know, a, American Farm Bureau is a member of, of FACA, Food and Agricultural Climate Alliance. Where do you think uh, the, the conversation's going on climate? The Senate passed their Growing Climate Solutions Act. I think you or, or your Republican colleagues have introduced a handful of specific climate related bills there in the House. Is this something that we're gonna see here in the next month or two, or is this just kind of hearings and dialogue and background and then say a bill moves in context of a farm bill in 2023 or, or another mega piece of legislation later this year? Your great question, Ryan. It's all playing out. I don't think we're going to see anything significant move in the next couple of months. The next really thing up on the priorities for Congress, the leadership of Congress is going to be infrastructure. So you hear a lot about that. Uh, I really appreciate Chairman Scott. His very first hearing was on climate, and, and he was very bold and loud in saying he wanted to put a stake in the ground from day one to say that agriculture needs to be at the table in these conversations, needs to benefit from it. And there needs to be an acknowledgement um, you know, in any policy that takes place federally that agriculture um, is, is part of the solution here and not part of the problem. So I feel like we're well positioned in the discussion. Uh, a lot of details to be worked out. I wanna make sure that you know, we, we can't reward bad behavior, meaning our early adopters, you know, agriculture has greatly diminished their greenhouse gas uh, emissions by market practices, you know, because the market made sense to do that over the last 15 years. We need to have an acknowledgement to make sure that we benefit from the good decisions for the environment that have been occurring uh, and so that we don't punish our early adopters and our bad behavior or, or you know, people that, that maybe um, could be doing more than they are. So it's playing out. We will see. Great. If we uh, stay kind of on this, this, uh, line of thinking, at least, uh, the 30 by 30 proposal, executive order from January 27th, if I remember right. And I, I believe you and your team just uh, hot off the press, at least from the White House, there's the renewing or restaining America the Beautiful proposal. Uh, granted, I haven't gotten through all, you know, every one and pay every last page of it and every detail, but I, I think it is, you know, at least a win for agriculture and private landowners from what we saw today. Any comment on, on that in particular? Yeah, yeah. So those of you who don't know, you know, the one of Biden's executive orders was called 30 by 30, which the concept is to make sure that we have 30 percent of our land in the country and 30 percent of our oceans um, are basically um, in conservation by 2030. So that, that's the premise. There then have been a lot of concerns with what does that mean? 
and what does that mean for private property rights? What does that mean for agriculture? Uh, there has been a lot of people, um, us included, expressed concern that the implementation of, of 30 by 30 would diminish personal property rights, uh, individual property rights. Um, we voiced that loudly as did Senator Marshall, Senator Moran, Governor Kelly sent a letter to administration as such. And, and as Ryan mentioned earlier, so we've been, we, we thought there was gonna be some guidance and some more details a couple weeks ago that was delayed. Um, this morning, they released their initial report. Um, this is the initial report that's going to the climate task force. And by and large, it was good news. Um, you know, there's a lot of details to work out, but but there were there were eight kind of core premises, if you will, or tenants. And the sixth one was to make sure that property rights are are protected and that um, th that the task force is supporting voluntary efforts. It's also important to realize in this 30% goal that existing land that's in conservation programs, i.e., you know, in other words, if, if land's in CRP today, that, count toward, that counts towards this 30% um, percent threshold, which is good news. So initially positive news, we still gotta be watching, we still gotta make sure that it makes sense for agriculture, but, but it certainly could have been much, much worse than what we saw today. And Congressman, I just greatly appreciate your leadership right out of the gate uh, when that thing popped, um, you know, read through at the staff level and, and flagged some concerns, specifically property rights, you know, if the federal government's ever going to get into a land buying spree, anything like that, Farm Bureau is going to come out opposed as opposed can be. And, and I know you've echoed those, those same concerns in some letters you've written over to Department of Interior and asked questions over at USDA. And you're exactly right. Senator Moran, Senator Marshall, and Governor Kelly uh, we're, we're basically you all were in lock force together and, and saying the you know, same message specifically on the private land side. Yeah. Any, you know, you mentioned also in kind of your opening comment, I guess I should pause here uh, for our attendees. If you have specific questions, please ask those via the, via the Q&A function or the chat box function. And we will be sure to, to ask Congressman Mann those. But I, I guess Congressman, real quick, uh, since you said there's really nobody other than you and, and Representative Dusty Johnson from South Dakota that represent the high plains and high yep. risk agriculture. Uh, certainly some native you know, grasslands out there, whether we're talking the Flint Hills or very near to you, the Smoky Hills and, and still in your district, the Jip Hills. Yep. Where do you think this whole conservation conversation, whether it is expansion of CRP, whether it's a new title or expanded roles in, in a future farm bill or any other program, where does high risk agriculture Agriculture need to kind of plant our flag as we uh, we move forward on that. Yeah, Ryan, that's a fantastic question. And frankly, we're going to, I have opinions on that. We're going to listen to Farm Bureau and our producers on, on what that ought to be. Certainly, uh, you know, conservation reserve, program, you know, they have their place. We also got to acknowledge when you take too much land out of production, that is um, very bad for our rural communities, or there's some negative impacts of that to our rural communities, to our, our rural populations and those types of things, you know, likely we are going to see under the Biden administration more of a push towards that direction. Um, however, you know, the next farm bill, if the farm bill will, the next farm bill will be passed after the next election here in 2022, if the pendulum swings, and then if suddenly uh, Republicans are in control in the House, which history would say is likely, uh, you never know in, in politics, but you know, that's going to have to get the farm will have to get through the House Ag Committee. Um, and so we will just see it's, it'll play out. It'll be really interesting. We'll be listening to our producers um, working with, of course, with the Farm Bureau and other ag groups to make sure that it's it works for Kansas and the specific types of agriculture that we have. I like what you said. Yeah. High plains and we have high risk agriculture and, and we got to make sure they have the risk tools, risk management tools in place to manage that risk. Well, glad you uh, glad you segued to that specifically because you know at least from a Kansas Farm Bureau perspective, and and maybe it's because you know Pat Roberts and you mentioned he hammered the gavel down down in the House and most recently the gavel over in the Senate, but uh, the Godfather of crop insurance, and you mentioned the the crop insurance caucus, 
are there conversations taking place? Because, you know, we, we could kind of talk and, and get uh, all policy wonkish here. But as I look at it, I mean, let's exclude SNAP and nutrition spending. But it looks like crop insurance is probably the next biggest piece of the pie when we talk farm bill. And certainly over on the Senate side with some of the, the changes in committee membership over there and some of the same challenges you're having with the House Ag Committee, there's a lot of folks that don't know production ag. So where do you think the, the future of, of crop insurance is going to go? I, you know, we, that's where we've got to advocate loudly for it. Uh, we, we will see. You know, we got to make sure that, and, and that's where the climate conversation is included, because if um, payments to a carbon bank or something, you know, if that comes out of the farm commodities title, you know, then suddenly is agriculture, specifically is, is our agriculture better off for it? Um, all things we'll need to uh, to watch for. You know, it's it's lot lost on me that I get the pleasure of, you know, being in the seat that Senator that Pat Roberts sat in. Um, we um, were able to get his, so in his office, he had a marker board that was from the Dodge City Co-op. And, uh, and every day we look up the prices at the Dodge City Co-op for all the commodities and we write it on that board. So everyone in the office is well aware of what commodity prices are doing. And we all are reminded of Senator Roberts' legacy for agriculture. Uh, but it's really important that we make sure that people, you know, um, our friends in other parts of the country that don't deal with the same risk that we deal with understand how important it is that we have these management tools in place. Great. Uh, another friendly reminder, if there's questions, please put those in Q&A or chat. And uh, Congressman, this, this reminds me because when you were speaking there, Zoom popped up and said my internet connection was yeah. unstable. Uh, yeah. And I know this was you know, very near and dear to your heart, even when you served as the 50th Lieutenant Governor. Uh, when we talk infrastructure, we can talk hard infrastructure, whether or not that includes broadband or not. But what, where are some of the conversations on, on broadband going yeah. in, in Congress right now? A lot of positive conversations. Our fourth hearings, our most recent hearing for the Ag Committee was on uh, rural broadband, the importance of it. Uh, we're not, you know, that seems to be bipartisan support there. The question will be, how do we pay for it? There's a $1.9 trillion, with the, um, actually $2.1 trillion infrastructure package that was put forth. 25% um, of that, less than that goes to roads, bridges, what we think of traditional infrastructure. Uh, more money goes actually for the Green New Deal and electrification of, of vehicles than traditional infrastructure. But also in that is some money for um, broadband, which I think everyone agrees uh, broadband, um, rural broadband, its infrastructure should be included. Having a lot of conversation on what are the best delivery systems, um, what, what is the best way to you know, have public-private partnerships, uh, what is the best way that we make sure that, that we do this right, and that rural America doesn't get left behind, you know, and I think that COVID and um, like this Zoom we're having, you know, has expedited the acknowledgement of this need. You know, you can talk about school from home. Uh, we can talk about working from home. We can talk about uh, telemedicine. But if we don't have fast, good Internet connections, um, that's really not possible for, for us in, in rural Kansas and rural America. That might segue me segue me into the the billion or trillion dollar uh, question because we're we're obviously you know that that, that debt uh, clock just keeps on turning over numbers left and right, but it comes down to spending and, and even Farm Bureau we've got a lot of asks uh, and certainly through COVID and and the trade war before that uh, farmers and ranchers we were the tip of the spear. But having said that, we absolutely cannot pay for 1.9, 2.1 trillion dollar bills with monkeying around with a state tax, stepped up basis, capital gains. So sure. I know you hit a little bit of it on, on your introduction and kind of just general what's Congress working on. And, and I know Farm Bureau, we have an action alert. So your office mm -hmm. hopefully has gotten dozens, if not hundreds of uh, personal stories specifically yep. on, on transitioning family farms. But any deeper dive, I mean, the house is a little bit more challenging with that just simple majority. And, and you know, the backstop historically has been the Senate. So budget reconciliation, or are we gonna keep 60 votes, et cetera? Any yeah. deeper conversation you wanna have on, on the tax conversation? Sure, what that looks like. You know, our, I mean, I'm very passionate about keeping the stepped up basis. I'd love to do away with the state tax altogether. It's so detrimental, you know, agriculture, uh, you know, especially is impacted by that because as we all know, we're such a capital intensive generational business and industry, really unlike any other industry in the country. Um, 
So very concerned about, it, uh, frankly, uh, very concerned to see the one of the main one of the methods to pay for the two point one trillion dollar spending uh, is is you know these changes in our tax policies. So we've got to uh, raise the flag. We got to advocate loudly. Uh, you know, it's just been proposed. There'll be a lot of hearings um, over the next few months. This infrastructure bill, the, the indication is their plan or, or the, or the um, speaker's office plan is to try to get it through the house by August 1st, which means, you know, the next three months, two, three months are gonna be critical on that. So far, um, a lot of these policies that have passed the house barely, remember we have a five vote margin, um, are log jam in the Senate because of the filibuster rules. Um, the only thing that has passed is this $1.9 trillion spending bill because that's a, a budget reconciliation, which is the term that Ryan used earlier, and that only needs 50, 50 votes. And that vote was 50-50 and, and Kamala Harris um, passed that. The most conservative member of the US Senate is uh, from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. And uh, many would say that the most powerful person in Washington today's first name's Joe, but it's not Joe Biden. It's Joe Manchin because he's the one that that is standing very firm on not changing the filibuster rules and requiring a lot of these seismic things that need 60 votes. Um, he's signaled on infrastructure and on these on these spending bills that have been proposed that they're too big. He wants them narrowed. Um, how important things like stepped up basis, um, things like keeping the estate tax where it is or lower or done away with altogether. The party that he he makes of that. Being from West Virginia, um, he's not signaled yet, but but we will see. So, you okay, know, kind of staying on that moderate term, if if we can even use that in today's environment, but bipartisan and reaching across the aisle, and specifically on the the tax conversation. I uh, read a, a letter that actually came from one of your committee members over on the other side of the aisle, Representative Axney, a Democrat from Iowa. I think she had eight or nine other Democrat colleagues that actually penned a letter to Speaker Pelosi and, and others just kind of holding the line on uh, stepped up basis as it comes to you know farm and, and ranch transition. So are those conversations, I, I know you mentioned a lot of it's still virtual, but are those conversations even from a, a rural Republican, rural Democrat, are, are those conversations taking place or have they taken place by chance? They're, they haven't been taken place yet. You know, they were included in the legislation that was released. That legislation really hasn't hit a committee yet. It really hasn't been kind of front and center and the focus. So, you know, I'm learning, and you all probably know this, but you know, every week kind of has its own theme where there's these seasons to the legislative calendar. Uh, the last, um, we were back in Washington two weeks ago, and that week was all about Washington DC statehood, but um, infrastructure bill, the American Families Plan, changes to our tax policy, that really has not come into focus yet. Uh, and it would not come into focus on the Ag Committee. So, um, you know, these changes in our tax policy would be in the Ways and Means Committee because they oversee that. And so certainly um, the Republicans on the Ways and Means Committee understand the how damaging this would be for agriculture and a lot of our other small businesses and, and business owners, family owned businesses around the country. So it's not just agriculture against everybody else. Um, but we've, we've got to tell the story loudly because it'd be very, very bad for our industry. Congressman, maybe uh, pivoting, pivoting a little bit here, um, the, the, the supply chain disruption, and we could talk cattle market back in peak COVID, April, May timeframe, but uh, I'm looking at some of the attendees that are on today, and I know I've heard from them, and I know my parents' operation back in McPherson County, we, we've got some personal supply chain disruption still, whether it's glyphosate or whether it's, you know, getting a steel chassis, uh, probably not a legislative solution, but are, have you had conversations with the Department of Commerce or others when it talks about ports and, you know, the backup from Evergreen and, and just the whole supply yeah. chain disruption? Very, very much so. You know, it's, it sheds a lot on the fact that we are living in a global economy today. And when you have disruptions to container ships um, or the ports of LA Long Beach, and you know that affects agriculture in Kansas. And that wasn't true 50 years ago, but that's true today. Conversely, that's also how we get, that's how we access those important markets, which is why we are, see, we are seeing the commodity prices as high as they are today. So um, yeah, we have been speaking up very loudly, sent a letter to the Maritime Co Commission talking about this backup um, at the ports you know, the challenge is then getting containers inland 
uh, to then fill with our ag products to ship back. So we are advocating for that. You know, a lot of it is due to COVID shutdown. Um, so the, the LA Long Beach Port, the Longshoremen Union, so the union workers that offload those containers, offload those ships, they're a very powerful union. Um, they have been working part-time at best because of COVID. And, um, and it's a group that when they want to, they, in, you know, they flex their muscles and uh, to the detriment of the supply chain for the country. So not good. I mean, you know, for example, my dad in Quinter, Kansas, uh, you know, trying to get a ladder is not urgent, but needs a ladder. And the wait time to get a ladder in Quinter is like two and a half, three months, um, you know, which is just indicative of what we all are dealing with, really concerned about our ag supply. I'm concerned with how our input costs, Ryan, are increasing. You know, you yes, prices are up, but boy, inputs are up too. And what that does to our margins, uh, we've got to, especially if there's a correct or a reduction in our commodity prices, we know typically input costs don't fall correspondingly. And it's something we got to be taking a close look at. I feel like I'm supposed to, to make a joke, you know, uh, timber, it, it's, uh, it's an agricultural product as well. So if your dad needs a, a ladder, he could probably build, build one himself, but it, it may be a lot more expensive with uh, whatever lumber he can get there in Quinter than just waiting on the aluminum or, or the, the, the purchase ladder. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that's exactly, and not an urgent need, but that's just a, an example of what everyone on this Zoom call knows that we're dealing with. Um, and I think we got to be thoughtful about you know, the government has put so much money into the economy. Um, we are, you know, that's going to result in inflation. Um, how much money gets injected will impact that. And then we got to be asking ourselves, so what's going to be the impact of that um, for interest rates? You know, typically inflation goes up to combat that. Then it impacts monetary policy where interest rates go up. That then in turn impacts the value of farmland because, you know, you're reduced. You look at your monthly payment in many ways as much as the price and so all those things are interconnected and so i would argue that spending this many trillions of dollars which will raise rates which will decrease farmland values very bad for kansas agriculture and for our producers yeah since you kind of talked inflation and the price of things going up any update by chance from FERC or or other partners on the energy front both uh, you know the electron and and actual you know electricity but also on natural gas with what we experienced back in February. Yeah, you know, we have been asking a ton of questions. Uh, we need to make sure that, that nothing improper um, occurred, no price gouging occurred. All those questions have been raised. There's not been much in the way of responses yet. It's something certainly that we um, talked to a lot of Kansans about, a lot of our producers about, you know, kind of, a gen kind of the imperfect storm, if you will just how large that storm was, a lot of things. I, I think it does show though that we cannot only be re solely reliant on renewable um, energy sources. And, and you know, we've got to, we are a economy and, and a lot of Western, throughout Kansas, we have a strong oil and gas sector and the economy needs it, but the, um, you know, for, for the sake of itself, but also our ag producers need um, fossil fuels to operate um, our, on the input side of the industry. We gotta make sure that we are watching out and watching for policies that negatively impact uh, the, the fossil fuel industry. Great. Well, uh, last uh, shout out I'll give on any, uh, pan or any attendees, excuse me, that have a question, please put that in Q&A or the, the chat box feature. If not, um, I, I may turn it back over to President Feltz. If, if you've got the, the real tough questions, Rich, Well, I tell you, the tough questions are is, is one, we, we appreciate having you there representing us. And we were, have a lot of concerns here. Uh, we've gotten into this administration. A lot of them were kind of coming about before we got in here, but a, a little different movement than we're used to having. Uh, we had so many favorable phrases. Now we have to work with a lot of individuals that don't understand our concerns and in our industry as well as some of the others. So it's very important that we have someone like yourself that can do that. We have many challenges. I don't think the general public understands the work that you do and how it impacts, impacts each and every one of us's lives. So here again, very, very thankful that you've been able to represent us. Look forward to the great work that you're going to continue to do. And especially 
appreciate you taking time this evening to kind of share your thoughts and your philosophy. You're new to many of us. And the more we see about you and understand how you are truly representing the grassroots of our organization. And, and as we like to say in our organization, we're the voice of agriculture, but we also have to have partners like you that are a voice of agriculture when we're in DC as well. So if we don't have any other questions, uh, appreciate you being with us this evening on our virtual town hall and hopefully in the near future, we're gonna be able to do these more in person. So with that, thank you very much this, for being with us this evening, Congressman. Well, th thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Happy to join anytime. Let me know how I can be helpful. So thanks a lot and have a great evening, everybody. And before we sign off, I just want a reminder that uh, our next town hall will be at a little different time frame, but it will be with Senator Marshall and it will be on Wednesday, June the 9th at 7.30 in the morning. So that'll be 7.30 a.m. So with that, we appreciate all of you being with us this evening and have a great evening.